Happiness is a massive topic. Where do you even begin? <laughs> Popular podcast, more than 35 million downloads. Why are our young people so unhappy? So if you look at very happy people, what are they doing differently? What you find is they spend a lot of time with other people. They don't spend a lot of time on screens. They spend more time just proportionally in real life, whether that's being present, walking around outside or something. Touching grass. Yeah. yeah. All negative emotions really have a good evolutionary purpose. Boredom is our cue that like, oh, I should go out and do something stimulating. I should find something meaningful. Whereas when we can kind of slap the screen band-aid on our boredom, we never have to feel it long enough to find what we really want to do. Happiness tends to have this sort of U-shaped curve. It starts off good when you're young, you're a kid, you tend to be pretty happy, and then you get to midlife and it kind of sucks. There's lots of research showing that perfectionism is going up. Since the 80s to now, there are like 30 to 40 percent increases. The level of depression right now nationally is more than 40 percent of students report being too depressed to function most days. And that number has doubled in the last eight to nine years. Similar things for anxiety right now. Anxiety is at like... Lori, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Happiness is a massive topic. Where do you even begin <laughs> when you approach this? I mean, if someone comes up to you at a party and you say, hey, I study happiness, how do you even start to talk about this topic? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, you go way back, right? I mean, Aristotle was talking about this stuff. It's in the Declaration of Independence. So it's not like a new thing right. that people are pursuing this stuff. But yeah, I mean, I usually start with the story of how I got interested in this yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'd love to like, hear that. Yeah, I was like a nerdy professor who studied animals for a long time and then switched and made this pivot to studying happiness and mental health because I was seeing the mental health crisis in my students. Mm. I took on this weird role at Yale which is called the head of college. So your faculty who live on campus with students. And you know, I expected college life to be what it was like when I was there in the 90s, which was like, you know, there was stress and stuff, but it was mostly fun. And that just like was not what I was seeing in my mm. community. I was just seeing so much anxiety and depression and, you know, students who were suicidal. And it, it was just like jarring that like the yeah. mental health crisis was so bad. And you would say that that took place over the course of a decade or so, that change, that shift? Yeah, well, what's interesting is you look at the data, I mean, these things are skyrocketing. Right. So the yeah. level of depression right now nationally is more than 40 percent of students report being too depressed to function most days. And that number has doubled in the last eight to nine years. Similar things for anxiety right now. I think anxiety is at like 67 percent of students say they're overwhelmingly anxious most days, college students nationally. Yeah. Those rates just were not there. My colleague who runs the kind of mental health and counseling at Yale is fond of saying, you know, the rates are skyrocketing enough that we know they'll level off. But that's just because like 100 percent of people <laughs> need yeah. clinical care on college campuses. And so so, and it was just in my community, right? I was just seeing these students who are really struggling and realizing like, hang on, my field has some strategies we can use to, to do better, to feel better, to kind of feel less depressed and anxious. And so I kind of developed this class to like teach students these strategies, sort of retrained in the science of happiness yeah. and put together the class. And that was when everything changed for me because the class went totally viral yeah. on campus. We had a quarter of the entire Yale student body signed up to take the class. Well, and you did a Coursera thing too, right? It's Four million downloads or something? Or Yeah. And every time we put out content, it's just like people flock to it. Right. I think it's because people want to be happy, but also people are struggling right now. Like there's legit things in 2024 that are making us all feel overwhelmed and burned out and scared and what's you know. the root because obviously i mean there's band-aids and then there's like the root cause yeah like when you did your research where did you begin and how did you start to assess out what's causing all of this and why now yeah i wish there was a silver bullet because it would make it so easy because we could just get rid of whatever that thing was oh, mean, and make everything the iphone yeah the iphone <laughs> right yeah technology is probably part of the answer here right and i should say like it's not just I think everybody points the finger at social media. I actually think it's it's deeper than that. I think it's just like these devices that we have that often steal our attention away from real world things. And if you plot like those rates of depression I was just mentioning, mm -hmm. and you plot number of iPhones in teen pockets, like Do the they line, they look like, perfectly. Oh my I God. Mean, correlation doesn't equal causation, obviously, but like it looks pretty bad, right? Yeah. One of the things technology promised us, especially, you know, phones in our pockets was connecting with other people, right? Being social in real life. Right. And I think what's shocking is that how much we use it to not be social in real life, right? Like, you know, we're here having this conversation in Austin at South by Southwest. And if you walk around this conference where there's so many interesting things to see and do, you'll see a bunch of people sitting around scrolling like this oh, on their 100%. phone, not talk, you know, they pay to come interact with these amazing people. There's this opportunity cost where we're hanging out on this tiny screen all the time. And so 
And that I think has real psychological consequences. Liz Dunn, who's a professor at UBC, does these studies where she just checks what happens to people's social interactions when they have their phones with them versus not with them. Mm. So you're sitting in a waiting room and you either have your phone or not. And she measures these subtle things like how often people smile at one another. Mm -hmm. And she finds that smiling decreases like 30% mm. when your phone's around. Because you're like not even looking at the people around you. You're just like locked into your phone. What, what's causing that though? Like what do you think the phone provides that is, because if you're having a, a real intimate friend conversation, someone's struggling, you're sitting down with them, you're grabbing a beer or something, that's meaningful to me. It, it feels much deeper than a chat, right? Totally. But what is it that's pulling people, like if they, South by, for example, they have the ability to go and connect and laugh, have fun, hang out, but yet they're choosing the device over the humans, which in theory, the human connection should be more powerful, but yet the phone is winning. Yeah. Why? So I think the phone wins for two reasons. One is like, it's just easier, right? If I'm at South by and I have to talk to someone, you know, say you're standing up, they're like, hey, you know, how did you come to South uh, by? What are you doing? Party. There's like this teeny friction, right? Yeah. It's not that bad, but there is some friction. Whereas my phone, there's no friction. I just pull it out and there'll be something interesting. And I think we're worse at the friction than we have been because we're out of practice at it. Mm. I think, you know, old, older folks like us, because COVID, I think our young people just never do it in the same way that we grew up doing it, right? Like. You know, if they go to go pick their friend up at, you know, at their house, they don't like go knock on the door and have to talk to mom of like, where's Joey? They just text like, I'm outside, come, you know? So there's like, they have less, I think younger individuals have like less practice with that friction. So I think friction is one thing, but I think we just forget how interesting our phones are, like how yeah. much cool crap's on it. Yeah. But your brain doesn't forget, your brain knows. My Liz Dunn, who I just mentioned, she's this analogy she uses, like imagine to this conversation instead of like bring my cell phone, which is in my pocket right now, I brought this big wheelbarrow and in the wheelbarrow was like printouts of every email I've had since like 2005, like big DVDs with everything that's on YouTube from like right. cat videos to porn, like printouts of everything Donald Trump and Biden has said in the yeah. last week, every like CDs of every song that's on Spotify and this big wheelbarrow that went up into the sky. Like you and I would want to have a conversation, but you'd be like, oh, let me, I just want to take a real quick pick at that cat video or whatever. Right. Like your brain's not stupid. Your brain knows that that full wheelbarrow and many, much, much more that I don't have time to say is on the other side of that right. phone. You know, you're super interesting, it's fun, but like, I don't know, are you as interesting as every cat video out there, right? right? So I think we've created this enormous temptation for our attention that's in the pockets of billions of people around the world and we don't know psychologically what that's doing to us. Yeah. So it's happened again. Last week, I got a notice in the mail, another data breach. This time it was with my healthcare provider. I'm sure you've been here. Sadly, this problem is not going away. Obviously, they tell you to go and lock down your credit reports, but there's so much more at stake here. From the second your data is breached, it's being resold by companies called data brokers. Now, the good news is that as evil as these companies are, they're also companies. So that means that if you take your time to monitor, to find your data, and then you hire a lawyer to send them takedowns, you can have some success. Now, obviously your time is more valuable than that. So I want to tell you about a service that I use and it's today's sponsor, it's called Delete Me. They use a power of attorney to work on your behalf to find and methodically remove your data from these data brokers. And they are continuously monitoring these sites. There's over 750 of them out there and they keep removing your data as it shows up, which unfortunately, it constantly does. And recently, Delete Me has expanded their core service, which is the ability to easily extend protection and peace of mind to anyone that you wish to include in your Delete Me account. They have a new area, it's called the Family Account Management, which creates this unified hub for your entire family privacy protection. And right now, you get 20% off all plans with the code Kevin Rose. Head to joindeleteme.com slash Kevin Rose. This week's episode is brought to you by Dram. Now, you've probably heard me mention that way back in the day, back in 2000, when I was a wee lad, I gave up soda absolutely cold turkey. That means nothing with corn syrup, aspartame, sugar, or any other crap, but I still really love sparkling beverages. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Dram. Dram is unlike anything you've ever had. It's packed full of real functional ingredients made from plants. Imagine a drink that's zero calories, zero sugar, and it's made with steam distilled organic ingredients. They have this citrus flavor that has orange blossom, hibiscus, lemon salt, Ryan from a grapefruit, it's fantastic. And my favorite though is their cola. It tastes just like classic cola, 
but it's made with adaptogenic mushrooms such as chaga, lion's mane, shiitake, and cordyceps, but you don't even taste the mushrooms. It tastes just like cola. Lastly, I love that their cans are BPA free and that their water is free from those harmful, they call them these forever chemicals that are really bad for you. None of that in their water. It's just absolutely fantastic stuff. You gotta give it a try. If you head on over to kevinrose.com slash dram, you'll get my three favorite flavors as a bundle pack and you'll also get 20% off everything at the store. So use the code Kevin Rose. That's kevinrose.com slash dram, D-R-A-M, and the code Kevin Rose. And thank you, Dram, for sponsoring the show. One question I have for you, you know, this is kind of like a, a li little straw man theory I had in my, my head. When I find myself addicted most to my phone, and let's just call that, I would say that is in those moments of Instagram or TikTok reels. Reels to me are the most addicted thing because... As the algorithm fine tunes itself, it's finding the dumb stuff that I laugh my ass yeah, off at. Yeah. Now, back in the day, I'm old enough now to remember before pre-cell phone, right? Pre-cell phone, you would have one of these moments once a week with your friends where someone would fall out of a chair, something hilarious would happen, and you would laugh your ass off. And it was like, that was so awesome that we all experienced that. And you'll laugh about it for years to come. Now I'm having that moment every 30 seconds. So the the reward that I'm getting every 30 seconds is like those rewards that I used to get once a week. And it's just like nonstop. And so here I am being entertained to the nth level like that I absolutely love. And then when I don't have that any longer, now I'm, I have to sit with my feelings and my emotions and everything else and the things that I don't like. Is that part of the issue, do you think? Yeah. So there's some evidence that things like boredom proneness is going up, right? Like that when we when we have this moment where we can't whip out our phones and look at our reels, we feel this intense, terrible boredom. Mm. But also the stakes get higher, right? Like, you know, because we have this like dopamine hit on the funniness stuff every 30 seconds and these algorithms are making that, you know, even more frequent and even more powerful a dopamine hit. It means that like real life just hasn't kind of caught up. You know, again, like I, my husband's a philosopher. We have great dinner party conversations, but like, you know, he doesn't have an algorithm in his brain that's like tracking what I find funny and super right. interesting and updating every 30 seconds to kind of give me content that I like. And I think that means that like temptation wise, we're really pulled to the screen world, the TikTok world. Oh, interesting. But in terms of if you think of like our psychological nutrition, the kind of like actual psychological joy we get out of it, we get the sort of quick dopamine hit from the TikTok. But as soon as you put it down, you feel like gross and lonely and maybe yeah. overwhelmed and like a little, you know, dizzy or whatever. Whereas you don't get that from talking to people. I think this is something that's just like neuroscientifically just like super fascinating, which is like our reward systems are weird and we don't necessarily go for and crave the rewards that are going to make us feel the best in life. There's this interesting neuroscientific disconnect between systems that code for wanting versus liking. You know, so if I had this long dinner with my husband, we have this intense conversation, I'll like that. I'll feel really connected to him afterwards. That will feel really pleasurable for me. But I don't necessarily like want that or crave that in the same way I might for like the next reel and like a TikTok right. series, right? right? Like that I crave, I really want. Right. But if you were to kind of measure in my pleasure centers of whether or not I liked it, I might get that like quick hit off of liking it, but it's not like a deeper liking. And it turns out that this is just a feature of the brain that like these right. circuits that code for wanting and craving and going after stuff are just different than liking. And that means there's all this stuff we crave that we'll spend money on, we'll spend our time on that we don't end up liking in the end. It also means there's all this stuff we really probably will like that we don't have craving for. Yeah. You know, like deep social connection or like contem contemplative time where mm. you're just kind of present or you know, even to a certain extent, like exercise and moving your body. I think some people get the craving for exercise, but like, yeah. I'm just not one of those. Like I have to work at it and force myself it to like do it months. all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get into it. So I feel like if we could just, if we could line up the brain systems for wanting and liking, we'd be better off. But but what makes companies money is algorithms that just tap into the wanting. They don't really care about the liking. So In my mind, it, it's not any one thing. I have to feel it has to be, you know, a, a composition of, of different aspects of life and interactions and things that we do to to create the perfect like stew of happiness right is that accurate to say because tiktok's not gonna make me happy deep just deep conversations with my wife aren't gonna check every single box that i have what does that composition look like and how do you actually teach that to people part of it's just overcoming the misconceptions we have about the stuff that we think is going to make us happy but isn't going to work right you know so in our young people today it's like 
they think that, you know, the main thing in that big composition pile is like money. If I could have money and right. fame, then I would be fine. And it is true that if you don't have any money, then getting some money is important, right? You get, right. A, you get your basic needs sorted. But the evidence suggests that once you do that, you know, more and more and more infinitely, it doesn't have a kind of infinite slope on your happiness, it, it right? It definitely doesn't. Levels Jim Carrey up. talks about this a lot. I don't know if you've seen a lot of his, yeah. his mm-hmm. talks. Fantastic talks. Yeah. And just like, and that's like the kind of money and fame, right? Because I think we all put that yes. up there. So that's one that I think we kind of get wrong. I think just even like selfish material pursuits, we think happiness is about, you know, me, me, me. I mean, even if you look at happiness advice, it's about like self-care or, you know, treat yourself or these right. kinds of things. But the evidence seems to suggest if you look at happy people, happy people are much more other oriented. They like do nice stuff for other people. They're really focused on other people's happiness. It seems like that's kind of a path to doing it better. And so a lot of what we do when we try to teach the composition is to say, you think this works, but it's not that, it's not that. And then come around to like, what is it really? And it seems to be really based in other people. It's, there's there's evidence. Like a path of service? A path of service, but just being around other people. Mm-hmm. If you look at very happy people, and, and the, the way people do this is, you know, we do these happiness surveys on these like well-validated psychometric measures. So you can say like, okay, these subjects are self-report being very happy. Right. What are they doing differently? And what you find is they spend a lot of time with other people. Their actions tend to be focused on other people. So they're kind of thinking about other people a lot. They don't spend a lot of time on screens. They spend more time just proportionally, like in real life, whether that's being present, walking around outside or something. Touching grass. Yeah, Yeah, touching grass, (laughs) you know, moving around. And they tend to have like paths of purpose, right? So they have a set of values that they're moving towards. So, So their actions when they're not towards other people, if they're like at work or volunteer or whatever, they're really trying to do something that fits with their values that's that, meaningful. That's a tough one because so many people, they just, they, they're stuck in a job that they don't enjoy. And this is, I think, you know, I think, of course, like, you know, we need to take into account there's real inequalities when it comes to the pursuit of happiness. It's way easier for some people than others to do things they find meaningful and go after their values. But one of the reasons I like the actual research on kind of pursuing your values is that it shows that many of us can get crafty about how we think of doing things that match our values in all kinds of different jobs. So one of my favorite lines of work on this is Professor Amy Resninski, who's at the University of Pennsylvania. She does all this work on what she calls job crafting, which is like you take your regular job description and you infuse whatever your values and strengths are, whether that's creativity or bravery or or social connection or you know persistence or learning or whatever it is. And I love her work because she studies it not in like, you know, the kind of creative folks that we see at South by. She does most of her work in hospital janitorial staff workers. Mm-hmm. You know, so these are people who are like cleaning up the linen in a hospital room. And what she finds is that like between 20 to 30 percent of them say that their job is a calling. They don't hate their job. They love mm-hmm. it. They, they wouldn't change it for anything. And when she digs into what they're doing, they're taking their normal job description and finding a way to like add this meaningful thing in. Is it a calling then or is it an addition of something that creates a calling? That is exactly that. Right. So it's like there, you know, one example she has is this guy who worked in a chemotherapy ward and, yeah. you know, this crappy thing about having cancer and having to get chemo is you get sick. So his main job was like cleaning up vomit because right. people throw up on the floor. And he said, yeah, yeah, I have to do that. But like my main thing is like I like humor and I like making people laugh. I like making mm. people like these people have like such a crappy Right. Life and right he can now. just get a cracked smile. That that's and he his had day. like his whole standard. Like he was like you know when he's kind of comedian. He like so his, his standard joke I guess was like he he makes fun of like oh you vomited again I'm gonna get overtime you keep throwing up this week like yeah, let's yeah. work it out you know and but then the person laughs he's like that's my job she she talks about another staff member who worked in a coma ward who heard, you know, she couldn't talk to the patients because the patients are, all, are in comas, but she would like move the art around or like, you know, plants like this little plant that were sitting near here. She'd like move the succulents around the room to like get creative. And that that was like how she found meaning in her work. And so Rosninsky's stuff basically says like, look, even in the kind of narrowest, you know, perhaps crappiest job, you can find ways to like bring in your yeah. your values and and what and what's cool about her work is you might assume if you were like a manager of these people you'd be mad at like the chemo guys you know ch- chat with the people and not cleaning up but what she finds is that managers self report that these workers are doing the best job at their real job description because mm. they love their job they're mm-hmm. like in a good mood they're not slacking off and trying to go to the break room they want to engage because mm-hmm. they've figured out a way and that's why I love her work it really suggests that like look any of us can job craft like yeah. we just have to get creative about ways to fit stuff in. One question about that, how much shaming comes from 
employment. Like I'll give you an example. When I travel to Japan, I always seek out small little artisans that are the best at their craft. And I met this guy one time in Tokyo that is known for aging coffee beans. And so he has like, you know, coffee beans that are 10, 15 years old. It takes him about 20 minutes to make a single cup of coffee because he does this insanely slow pour process that just takes forever. So he can probably do, I would say, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 of them a day. And you have to be lucky enough to get in. And the price is about, I'd say seven US dollars, something like that. Was it good? He, it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And he wears a, a bow tie and he dresses up and he's like dressed to the nines. And there is so much pride in what he does. And not only pride in what he does in the way that we in the States say, hey, I love a mixologist that makes a good drink, but pride from the community as well and a respect for someone that just hones their craft. I don't think we have that here. Capitalism isn't awesome about respecting those kinds of yeah. things, right? Because you're like, oh my God, well, if we could train other people to do it and then like we make a machine that right. will make it really exactly. great and How stuff, we, we'll make, like, we'll scale it, you know, right. a couple of things. One is I think Riznensky's work shows that within the scope of people's typical job descriptions, like you don't have to have a job like that guy to find meaning, right? right. But if you are that guy and you have a craft that allows you to get meaning, it is the case that adding these extrinsic rewards on top of it winds up screwing up your feelings towards it, right? It is the case that, and, and I think we don't need to be a guy with that kind of level of talent and specific skill, right? You know, take the normal enjoyable pursuits we have like running, you get a Fitbit and now all of a sudden you get like obsessive about it. It's no longer the kind of internal reward you got from the right. running or, you know, I watch this in my students who like want to say like, oh, I'll, I'll like, you know, have like my like side hustle. Mm -hmm. And like at first the side hustle was just like, you did some art or you designed it because it was fun and now, you have a due date at Thursday at 7 p.m. and you hate it because you've got to rush to do it. Right. And it's like all the joy has been stolen from it. So I think it is the case that as we add these extrinsic rewards onto the stuff we care about, all of a sudden it feels yucky. And, and I think this is one of the reasons we're seeing so many increases in depression and anxiety, particularly among our teens and our young people, because we've kind of taken a lot of the fun stuff that kids did and turned it into like a like LinkedIn resume building, you know, like or or college application building process. It's like kids used to just play soccer, but now it's like, well, you gotta be on the soccer team and you do the, you know, oh, it's an right. extracurricular. Well, so that'll you think look that's good a big for piece of it. Totally. I think part is that they don't have any time anymore. This is another thing as we talk about the recipe for a happy life, free time and what or social scientists these days are calling time affluence, the sort of fact that you're wealthy in time, you seem like you have a lot of time, such an important part of our well-being. Yeah. And that, you know, I mean, you younger kids, like the kids are just so busy. They yeah. have, it's not like they play, they have a play date that has to happen at right. one o'clock and we got to drive in traffic to get there. And yeah, so we're kind of changing around what used to count as intrinsic rewards and was just fun. And we're kind of turning it more extrinsic and more scheduled and, and those features make it less enjoyable. Have you seen any old Mr. Rogers quotes oh, yeah. <laughs> when he's interviewed by Charlie Rose? He says one of the greatest gifts that he's received is the gift of silence, where he has that decompression time. And he's very well known for, I studied Mr. Rogers quite a bit because I love that guy. And I, I think he was enlightened. I think he just didn't totally, know. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, he used to swim every single morning and that was like his time, his, his silence. And he didn't miss a beat. He would go and swim for an hour. And, you know, I wonder how do we reintroduce silence into our everyday life? My youngest, who's five now, when I let her watch Daniel Tiger, because it's based on Mr. Mr. Rogers, which is a great show. And so we do give them some iPad time, not for games, but more so for just like educational content. She loves elephants, so she watches elephants, she, like actual elephant documentaries nice. and stuff. One got attacked by a tiger the other day, and I was freaking out. I was like, D "Danny Tiger is going to be destroyed." <laughs> yeah, well, this was a real <laughs> elephant, like getting like attacked by yeah. like a hyena, and I was yeah. like, I told my wife, "I'm like, did you check the rating on this before we put this on?" But anyway, I'm, I'm <laughs> when she is not doing something, a common thing that comes out of her mouth is, "What do I do?" Right. The show's over. What do I do? Like, how how do you you can't like teach silence. How do you handle that? I mean, I think we've all, including our kids, I mean, including five-year-olds have gotten bad at being bored. Yeah. Right? 
And and that there's like a real irony to that, given that like, you know, you can hand her a device with, you know, every you know, kid's TV show in the history of the world on it, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think we should have thought when we got all these technologies that what would happen is like boredom would be a thing in the past. Like you hear this term bored, our kids should be like, what is boredom, dad? What is right. that? But like, yeah, it's like an ancient I, technology. This is like, this ancient yeah. thing. We used to sit silently. <laughs> didn't have any, you know, didn't, didn't know what it felt like. But, but I think if anything, our kids are more bored than ever as soon as the stimulation stops. Yes. And that's, I think, the irony of it, right? You know, like I, I grew up, you know, like bad 70s TV watching Mr. Rogers. Like if you watch Mr. Rogers for the, you know, half hours on TV, like in the early, late 70s. Well, my like, kids can't watch it. It's not fast it's enough. So, yeah, so yeah. they need it to be faster. They need it to be infinite, right? And I think we've kind of developed this world where we never have to be bored. But but what boredom is, is so so all negative emotions really have a good evolutionary purpose. Like natural selection wouldn't build this stuff in. Boredom, right. sadness, loneliness, if it wasn't right. for something, right? And so I think boredom is our cue that like, oh, I should go out and do something stimulating. I should find something meaningful. I should find purpose, right? right. Whereas when we can kind of slap the, you know, the screen bandaid on our boredom, it means we never have to feel it long enough to find mm. what we really want to do. And I worry about this in kids. I worry about this in adults too. I'll watch myself when like I have those spare moments mm -hmm. and I'll grab my phone. Mine is an Instagram reel. It's actually just scrolling through Reddit embarrassingly, but it's like, you you're, know, you're, you're just, you're you're just keep, yeah, just like, yeah. you know, there's always a next page and there might yeah. be something cool on it and whatever. But that means I never have these moments where I, sit quietly and mm -hmm. have ideas or think about things or have insights or the best insights be actually th those shower moments are real so the advice actually you mentioned mr rogers and swimming the advice i get from a lot of these kind of experts on sort of finding silence is actually to swim to take a bath take a shower because when you're in water we don't have our phones i'm terrified that like our phone technology is going to figure out yeah. how to be in the shower and you, then, you know what's funny i just got one of those cold plunges from my house you know yeah. which i absolutely love i gotta tell you in terms of like just giving you a hit of just energy and, and peace. Fantastic. Mine came with an iPhone adapter on the side. Oh, no. <laughs> so it's like, I was like, oh, shit, it's everywhere. Well, it's I remember, us. I mean, again, I'm old enough to remember when we had the Internet and we had like a little Wi-Fi, but it wasn't like phones. It wasn't everywhere. And I remember being on trains before trains had Wi-Fi. Yeah. And it was such a good concentrated yes. work time and thinking time. And you just watch the world go by. Yeah. And then, you know, now the Amtrak has Wi-Fi. And it's, you know, it's, it's great in the sense that I get work done and I can connect with things and not be bored on the train. Right. But you've kind of lost something important yeah you've lost looking out the window and seeing all the beauty exactly and yeah. just kind of having you know i think our brains we we don't notice how much of that time we've lost in the last 10 years one of my favorite indicators of how 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 little time we spend not looking at our screens is that apparently in the last 10 years sales of gum like grocery store sales of chewing gum have gone down like, I forget what it is, but it's like 200 or 300 percent. And you're like, why does that matter? It's like, when do you usually buy chewing gum? You're in the line. You're bored. <laughs> you're looking around. You're like, oh, chewing gum. I'll grab it and buy it. That's a great like, point. Like impulse purchases of that form have gone down because we're not noticing this stuff anymore because our heads are I never even thought about that. I don't even pay attention to what's around the counter. Like when you're checking out, you don't even look anymore. Like, again, I'm old enough to remember, like, you know, the line's long. You grab the yeah. magazine. You kind of flip through the magazine. TV you're guide. like, oh, maybe I get like a little <laughs> yeah. candy or whatever. That just don't doesn't exist anymore. But like, what else are we missing? That's also the time when I might like smile at my neighbor in the line or just like kind of have a quick chat with someone and you know a lot of the evidence suggests that's those little tiny things of little noticing you know or i'll notice the girls in line with oh she's got such a cute dress and that's like these little hits of delight and joy mm -hmm. in the real world and i think those hits are psychologically much more nutritious than whatever hit i'm going to get in that line in 40 seconds scrolling through reddit yeah all right it's time to talk about notion i am always on the hunt and always playing with the latest and greatest productivity software notion is one that i've used for many many years now so i'm stoked to have them on as a sponsor notion has been a tool that's been taking my productivity absolutely to the next level i love the way you can build it out to suit your specific needs notion combines your notes your docs and your projects all into one space that's simple and beautifully designed. And they have this new fully integrated Notion AI, which helps you work faster, write better, and think bigger. Tasks that normally took hours, you can now do in seconds. You don't have to go to some external provider, any other AI product, it's all built right inside of Notion. If you haven't tried Notion yet, obviously you've heard about it. If you haven't tried it yet, you should definitely give it a shot. You could try it for free when you go to notion.com slash Kevin Rose, and when you use our link, you'll be supporting the show. That's notion.com 
slash Kevin Rose. Today's sponsor is NordVPN. Stay secure and anonymous online with NordVPN, which has been my trusted VPN for years now. I like it because you can access geolog content from anywhere. So I'm in Japan or Mexico at least a couple times a year, and I want to watch my favorite shows. And this comes in really handy to bypass all of that geofencing, and it needs to be fast. This is another essential thing for a VPN, and Nord is lightning fast because they have thousands of servers. So if you want to stream and game without lag, it's great. And then equally as important is privacy. They have a great policy, no logs, nothing to store, nothing to see, nothing to share, which is pretty much as good as it gets. And their apps are just really lightweight. So it's not bogging down your system the entire time. And they have it for desktop and mobile. Don't miss this incredible deal, which is two years at a huge discount plus four free months. If you use my link, nordvpn.com slash Kevin Rose, that's nordvpn.com slash Kevin Rose. And it's risk-free. There's a 30 day money back guarantee, which makes this a no brainer. What are your thoughts on perfection or perfect moments? One of the things that drives me a little crazy is I see these Google ads that, that talk about their camera capabilities with AI. And it's like, hey, if you don't like that person that was behind the camera, <laughs> use the magic eraser and circle them and they disappear. And in my mind, I'm never going to do that because that wasn't real. Yeah. Like that literally didn't happen. There was a person standing there. Like you literally wiped out someone's <laughs> existence. And but also if you're old enough to have old film like like photographs like of, of of you know when you were a kid and you flip through them, some of the most interesting things for me are always like what was on my desk? Yeah. I have a couple uh, uh, photos of me when I was younger messing around with computers and I had like some CD-ROM sitting on there. I was like, "Ooh, oh what, what what did I have on there? <laughs> what was I playing around with?" you know? And it's like now it's everything's going to be manicured and perfect and not an extra person in there. And, oh, there was a little smudge here. Let me remove that. Is that having a negative impact on us? Because it seems like this projection of perfection, luxury, money that is just it's it, it's everywhere we look. And, and, it, and it, it, it creates these um, expectations that in order to be happy, I have to have that lifestyle or look that way. Would you say that is as detrimental as, say, the, the the quick scrolling of just random funny cat videos? Yes, and maybe worse, right? I mean, for for all kinds of reasons, right? So so one metric that those kinds of technologies are fueling perfectionism is lots of research showing that perfectionism is going up. If you look since the '80s to now, there are like thirty to forty percent increases in the amount of perfectionism wow. our young people experience. Why is that? What's But the deal? it's not all forms of perfectionism. There's like kind of three kinds of perfectionism. One is like, I expect myself to be perfect. So it's my standards applied to myself, right? There's a kind of other focused perfectionism, which is like, I expect you to be perfect. You know, think of the like jerk boss who like, you know, forces or their employer, your kids, right? But the one that's going up most, they're all going up, but the one that's going up most is what's called socially prescribed perfectionism, which is, I think everyone else wants me to be perfect. I think everyone else wants me to be rich and have the perfect body and never be off in a photo, right? Mm. We kind of think the world is watching us and the world has expectations on us. And it turns out that that's a form of perfectionism that's most like insidious because mm. it makes us feel like my worth depends on my looks and my job and well, my I'm, wallet I'm, and all these things. And I'm sure that's even uh, amplified when you're younger and you're identifying who you are Totally. what your belief systems are, what your values are. And then this is being shoved in your face as being like, hey, this could be a value. Right. And you think about, you know, like I remember again, like aging myself and all these domains, but I remember like flipping through Seventeen magazine. And I was like, wow, this this is what, you know, teen girls like me are supposed to look like. There's this body and this right. kind of stuff. But I like closed the magazine and went out with my friends. I didn't have a thing dinging in my pocket that was right. telling me these things. And even the like Photoshop tools that those, you know, 17 magazine people had back in the day are nothing like the thing, the tools that we have today. And those tools are in the pockets of like all my mean girl middle school friends yeah. who are like posting their pictures online. And so I think the perfection that we see in the world has started to become embodied in the perfectionism we think the world expects of us. And the data are kind of bearing this out. I also think it's just like messing with our memories, right? I think we think we want, you know, the perfect shot of what things look like, 
But then those becomes the metrics by which we measure ourselves like later yeah. on. You know, where, as we said, so we're having this conversation at South By and, you know, I did the thing where you pose in front of the like South By mural with my friends. Yeah. And like, I, you know, somebody else took the picture for us. It wasn't a selfie. And I looked at it, I was like, oh, kind of, I didn't like the hair. I was going to do it. Right. But I was like, wait a minute, like that's what I look like here, right? right? Like if I perfect this photo, it's just going to make me misremember what was happening. And it's going to make me feel like crap whenever I look at that photo because, like, mm. normally my hair is not going to be, you know, like in a distribution, like two sigma perfect hair right. every day. Like, there's going to be other kinds of hair. And I think that's part of the reason why when you see people with like selfie sticks and you you run into an, an, an influencer from afar and you watch them take the same photo like thirty times and you're like, whoa, they're really needing this. Something is driving them to say this has to be absolutely perfect. Which is insane. Like, I, it must, uh, this seems uh, uh, like exhausting to me. Totally. And I think, like, they also look like a jerk, right? I mean, look yeah, at totally, all these videos totally. of, like, the influence, you know, I'm the main Those character so funny, in the by gym, the way. like, right? Do you so, ever yeah. watch, there are accounts dedicated to people taking photos of themselves, <laughs> yes, which, yes. which actually, in a horrible funny, way, I think it's horrible, hilarious. Yeah. yeah. But it is a sign that, like, again, we, we can't just accept ourselves on, like, photo number one. Yeah. We have to make it perfect. But, but when we do that, we're really missing out on, the memories and what these things are going to look yeah. like later. Absolutely. I guess I want to take it two directions, one with kids and one with adults. But like when an adult comes to you and says, I'm having a hard time. I don't know what my future is. I'm maybe I'm, you know, midlife crisis mode. I'm having these issues. I'm, I'm trying to find happiness. What are your strategies? If you were a therapist, the kind of like, how do you unpack where they are and how do you get them to a place of uh, a, a better place? Yeah. Well, one is just to normalize it, just to be like, yeah, it's you and literally everybody else. And 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 one thing, especially for folks like us in midlife to remember is that t happiness tends to have this sort of U-shaped curve. So it's like starts off good when you're young and you're a kid, you tend to be pretty happy and then you get to midlife and it kind of sucks. I think the nadir, it kind of varies depending on the study, but the best estimate I've seen is 48.6 the worse you're going to be. And then 48.6 years old. Yeah. Oh, that's shit, like, I'm the, not quite there yet. I know. So, I just, okay. I just passed it. I've like barely, cause I'm like about oh, so to turn 40 up dead. Yeah. I'm like, I'm all up something. but then the good news is like, it gets, it gets better as you get into older adulthood. But, um, so I think one thing is just to be like, that's just what happens. Yeah. It's just like how this goes. I think the second thing is like the, what the science shows is lots of strategies you can engage in to feel better. Oftentimes one of the reasons midlife is so unhappy is that people are really busy. You might just need to focus on feeling less time famished and find some time affluence, like take stuff off your plate, you know, try to take time to just rest and be. What are strategies for that, though, for someone that says, hey, like I, I, I have a, these conversations with my wife all the time and, and around like, you know, this idea of work life balance or being able to do things that we call it. They teach our kids this in school, like the, the things that fill your bucket. Yeah. How do you get people yeah. to, to, to make well, that change? One is to just get more time, right? And I think if you have some discretionary income, you can spend the money to get back time. Research mm. by Ashley Willens at Harvard Business School. She's fabulous. There's this whole book called Time Smart on all mm. these strategies to get more time. Her work shows that the more you spend money to get back time, the happier you are. So, you know, you like hire a cleaning service or you pay the neighbor's kid to like mow the lawn or you like get takeout, right? We go to restaurants and get food a lot of the time, but we don't realize, we don't think of it in terms of a time savings. Like that's, you, know, you go get pad thai, that's noodles you have to chop right. up and look at the recipe or whatever. That's an hour and a half. What did you do with that? Yeah, but let me push back on that for a second because I'm curious. Thich Nhat Hanh, Buddhist monk, are yeah. you familiar with his yeah, work? One of the things that he says is to wash the dishes is to wash the dishes. And to give people, that yeah. sounds weird to people, but what it actually means is rather than have your mind be in a thousand other places, you are dedicated fully in your being to being okay with being in this present moment and spending your time washing the dishes and how peaceful that is. But it becomes peaceful if you feel time affluent enough to wash the dishes. The problem is most people are not doing that. They're washing the dishes while they're, they're taking pissed. a conference yeah. call yeah. and they're like doing like, and so- Or they so, see it as a task that is just like beneath yeah. them or something. So the key is with the time saving, what you want to do is get rid of your unwanted task. It is, you know, the Buddhist monks are right. We could take any task and make it one that is mindful that we can enjoy and see the beauty right. in. But when you are so overwhelmed and you have you look at your calendar and there's a day like that you're not gonna go to you're not even gonna brush your teeth with that like kind of moment of right. presence everything's like ah. and so the key is like if you can 
get some of that off your plate, especially the stuff that you really genuinely don't like to do. Mm-hmm. Like I like cooking. I wouldn't want to offload, I mean, I don't have money to hire like a private chef or whatever, but I wouldn't want to offload that even if I could, right. but I freaking hate the dishes. If I could get somebody to unload the yeah, dishwasher, yeah. that's great, right? It's not to kind of get rid of all these tasks where you could be in the moment, but if your schedule is so frantic that you can't do that and you're lucky enough to have some discretionary income to do that, you can kind of offload those tasks. Ashley research is cool because she actually does it at different income levels. And she finds if you have any discretionary income, however you spend that to save time, whether it's like take your kids to, you know, again, hire the neighbor's kid to like, you know, clean up the yard or something like that can actually be helpful. An even better one, though, is to, to make good use of what's called time confetti. So journalist Bridget Schultz has this term time confetti, which is like, the five minutes in the grocery store at line or the 10 minutes when your kid falls asleep early and you've got a little extra, right. you know, she suggests that you need to use that well. The problem is we we blow it off. We look at TikTok. I'll be scrolling right. through Reddit, right? Whereas if I use that to take a breath, like text a friend, you know, get my bearings. Or call a friend. Call a friend. I mean, even moving your body, right, is a huge thing for happiness, exercising, right? Like do the seven minute New York Times workout if you get seven minutes. This way of using our time confetti yes. well can that, that, that's what I was going to ask you, because it's one thing to to say, OK, I'm going to hire someone to mow the lawn. But if you just then go and sit down and do TikTok, exactly. you, there's, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. there's no upside there. If someone says, hey, and we can take this to students as well. They're like, hey, I'm I'm depressed. I'm, I'm having a hard time here. Obviously, depression is something to take very seriously. So, I mean, you want to seek out professional help ASAP. But aside from that, in terms of like tangible things that people can do if you had to stack rank them maybe this is an impossible thing for, no, to, for you no, to do but like, try, yeah yeah would you say like you know walks outdoors social connection like, would social be connection? really high on the list how maybe about nature doing something for other nature nature bathing is a thing not as much in this country but forest in other bathing, countries being forest in Japan bathing is huge, yes yeah move your body exercise honestly for most young people sleep I actually think we could solve most of the young people mental health crisis mm. if we could just get them to sleep a little bit more, take a nap, Interesting. right? Move your body, take a nap, do something social. In terms of mindset stuff, so those are all behaviors, right? In terms of mindset, we can do a lot of hacks. So scribble in a gratitude journal, take some time to be a little bit more present, you know, screen away and just like, what does this room look like? We're in this beautiful space where you have these black walls. I could look at them, I could understand. Just that moment of like, I'm present, I'm embodied and I'm here. Mm can be a lot. Are you a meditator? I'm supposed to be a meditator. (laughs) I do meditate sometimes. I don't meditate enough as I should. I feel like I have other things that are meditation. Like I take a lot of walks. Like I don't drive to work. I like walk to work. And even though I'm a podcaster and I love podcasts, I try not to listen to podcasts. I try to have no music and just be present on my walks. Mm, That's great. Which isn't meditation per se, but it's my form of like Yes. being present and being with my thoughts and noticing. So, but meditation is a huge one, right? And and again, one that some work by Hedy Cobra and others is showing that like, you don't have to do it for like, you know, Buddhist monk style, like hours a day, five minutes, you know, can have these huge benefits, especially even to novice meditators who've never done it before. I have a friend that is, I would say she's addicted to information. Mm-hmm. Whereas like when she goes on a walk, she has to listen to audiobooks. Yeah. She has to like always be almost always, it's almost always audiobooks where it's like, you know, 10 a month, like perfecting things. Is is that a thing as well? Is that a bad habit? Is that like, can there be too much of a good thing? Yeah. They're all opportunity costs, right? Like far be it from me. I mean, there are probably people listening right now walking around. Don't shut it. Don't yeah, shut yeah, off yeah. the Kevin show. Going. Like keep the podcast going. At least right? this one, yeah. But like that means you might not be noticing what's on your walk or having free time to kind of let your mind wander. I think it becomes a problem when it, like there's like anxiety and you can't not have it, right? Mm. You know, I watched this happen, you know, we we're having this conversation a few weeks ago. I remember there's like this AT&T crash where like the cell phone tower went out and like none of the Wi-Fi was working. Right. You couldn't get on your email, you couldn't get on anything. And I was just watching people like the heroin Jones, man, where they were like oh, tapping. Yeah. I'm like, why is my iPhone not working? Right. Maybe I got to get on the network. And like, it, it's that that's a problem, right? You know, if you were out and you're like, oh, I left my phone at the house, you, you couldn't do the walk without some information. It's not so much that this stuff is bad. It's when this stuff kind of becomes the only way you yeah. can interact. It's important to kind of ask yourself sort of what else, what am I missing out on because I'm doing this? Like, how much do hobbies play a role in happiness? I took a pottery class one time. Beautiful. Yeah, fantastic. And really present. You're kind of super in it. present. Yeah. You have to be constantly paying attention to what's going on, especially if you're using a wheel. 
And I didn't stick with it, but it was a, a beautiful break and it got me off of my phone. Yeah. Are there are there habits that you see? I mean, obviously we talked we already talked about exercise and running, that's the huge one. Are there other habits that people pick up that tend to lead to good outcomes? Yeah, I mean, I think the the key is that like the one of the reasons the pottery is so powerful is that the presence part, right? Like you're there, you're not using your phone, it's forcing you to be mindful. Another is that you're kind of learning, right? You're sort of bad at it, so your growth curve is kind of high, and that puts you in a state of what researchers like me, high cheek set me high, call flow, right? Where the challenge is kind of high, but you're getting skills that can do it, yes. and you have to fully pay attention. And flow states wind up being incredible states for our well-being. You don't necessarily have to get it through pottery. You can get it through, you know, making bread or skiing. Or mm. the key is that you're doing something that like has your challenge. It's hard, right? You yes. have to have your attention, but you kind of are building skills at the same time to mm. do it. Those flow states feel great. But but I think another thing about the pottery is my guess is you weren't doing it as like a side hustle to like sell your you know no. pots or something. Yeah. It was purely for the entertainment yes. of it. And I think we these days it's hard for us to find these things that we do purely for the entertainment of it. It's really easy to get competitive about it or to stick a number on it mm. or to like, you know, want to monetize it somehow. And every time we stick those extrinsic rewards on something, it makes it less intrinsically enjoyable. Mm. There's this large psychological phenomenon that, that extrinsic rewards crowd out intrinsic rewards. So if you like give somebody a grade for something, or you're gonna get paid for your pottery, right. or I'm gonna rank it or rate it, all of a sudden you're not doing it because it was fun and you had flow and you're enjoying it. You're doing it because like, oh, I wanna get the, the better rank or I wanna win the competition or something. Yeah, I read, I've read about that. And especially when it comes to bringing friends into tasks, like if you offer to pay a friend to, to help yes. you move versus mm -hmm. you know, actually, can, can you talk about that a bit? We kind of don't understand how rewards work. It's kind of the general feature of psychology, which is like there's so much stuff we have misconceptions about that we kind of stick our feet in it when we kind of get it wrong. And so you'd assume that like adding a reward to something would make it good, right? right. Like, you know, if, if I was, if you like doing pottery, I'm like, let me pay you to do pottery. Then you get the liking of the doing pottery plus you're getting paid right, right? you know your friend's gonna help you move it's like well you know they're gonna help me move and i'll pay them and it'll make it better but it turns out these extrinsic rewards undermine it like your mm. friend if, if you you know your friend tried to help you move you tried to pay them like oh how much was that worth your time what's your hourly rate oh i'll give you you know 450 dollars whatever it is right. they'd be like no nah, i was doing it for, I, uh, for what I wanted to do it for yeah. love. And and so these backfire effects are kind of clever. There was a very famous one of a, a daycare center that uh, you know had the problem where parents were kind of showing up a little late mm. and the parents would feel guilty, but it sucked for the daycare center. And they're like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to charge parents. Every time parents come in late, we're going to make them pay. Like $10 or something. $10. I heard about like, this. Yeah. What happens? Parents come so much more late. 100% right. of the parents. Now that they're, they're like, okay, now they're I get like, it. I can just pay. So we're in like a transactional mode, right? Yeah. As opposed to like, a, you're just helping me and it's kind of out of your guilt and your enjoyability. And I think, again, this is our, we have this kind of interesting internalized capitalism and in how we think motivation works. We think, oh, I'll pay people more or I'll kind of give someone a reward. And what that does is it makes people's normal reasons for doing something kind of go away. I think this is part and parcel of why we're having all these discussions about things like quiet quitting and so on mm -hmm. and why there's sort of a disconnect sometimes between the way young people think about work and old people. Whereas like we've gotten so involved and thinking about like the value of our work as a monetary thing. We've sort of missed out that sometimes the value of our work is like a, a deep intrinsic reward thing or like the value we get out of doing a good job and so on. But that goes away when you put, when you're so kind of focused on yeah. the monetary side of it. We see this, I think, in our young people with grades, right? Where, right. you know, I think there was a time when school was about learning and it was fun and because learning is fun, right? We kind of like yeah. doing these things. You slap a grade on something, all of a sudden it becomes not not enjoyable. Mm. It was really old work in the 70s by the psychologist Susan Harder had kids doing these like anagrams and puzzles. Like, so they're doing these kind of fun puzzles, but then she has some kids get grades for them. And what she finds is that when kids start getting graded, for them they don't enjoy them anymore when they're doing them they show before the grade like they'd have like all you know they're smiling and they're having fun and they're enjoying it now with the grade they think it sucks and when you give them choices of which puzzles to pick the ones who are getting graded pick the easiest ones because mm. they're like well my god i'm just trying to get the best grade right. if you don't have grades you pick the hardest you pick the hardest ones that right. you can do because you're like i'm only doing it because it's fun right? yeah it's challenging and if you don't w win who cares it was just like a good challenge yeah and so i think our mistaken theories of motivation sometimes wind up meaning that we take something that's fun 
and we give it something, a like, a ding, mm -hmm. a, a cost, a grade, you know, like a payment, a, bon a Christmas bonus or whatever, and then we just make it less enjoyable. Yeah. And you make people perform worse because they're just trying to like do it the fastest possible to get the right. grade. What do you think about, I had heard this term a while ago, and I don't know how it applies to your research, but th there was this idea floated of uh, experience stretching, mm -hmm. where you start off, and, and, and the way that I heard it framed to me was that you go out and, you know, in Hawaii, you're in a beautiful place, and you see this amazing sunset, and you're like, God, that was just a beautiful sunset. Next day, same thing happens. This time, somebody hands you, you know, a Mai Tai at the same time. And you're like, ah, oh, damn, this Mai Tai is good. This sunset's great. Yeah. This is an even better experience, right? Mm -hmm. And the next day, you know, you can level up from there. Someone hands you a cigar, whatever your, your, your poison is, right? Or it doesn't even have to be a poison. But they add to the experience. And then all of a sudden, the next time you're presented with just a simple sunset, you go back to, well, it was better if I only had those two extra, yep. three extra yeah. things. And you stretch that out. Once you're stretched, how do you pull that back in? And is that a real thing? Totally. Yeah. This is what psychologists call hedonic adaptation. You're sort of on this hedonic treadmill and you kind of just get used to stuff over like time. Like hedonic, like hedonism? Like hedonism, right? Yeah. It's a fancy way of saying we get used to stuff. You see the sunset the first time. Right. That's great. You see it the next time. It's okay, but it's not maybe as good as the first time. You experience stress. You don't just get sunset, but you get sunset in Mai Tai. Right. Now when you go back to sunset... It's kind of crappy, right? right? And it's like, or so if you just have a mai tai, you're like, where's my where's sunset? my sunset <laughs> yeah. with it? And so this is the sad thing about great experiences in life because we get used to them and they become the new standard. Once you have an amazing experience, it like kind of ruins experiences for can you. Can you go back? Rest. So you can, and there are ways to, right? One is um, one of my favorite strategies is it actually goes back to the ancient Stoics. They had this idea they called negative visualization, where they thought every morning you should just take five minutes into meditation to think that all these terrible things are gonna happen. Like my wife is gonna leave me, my I'm gonna lose my job, I'm gonna not be able to walk, my this. car's gonna get hit. I already this do this, this, is, this, is, this isn't like hours and hours of ruminating yeah. about. This is just like one moment about it. My, my favorite one, the one that's most effective, I use this in talks sometimes is you know, you mentioned you, your kids. Imagine right now, last time you saw your kids, it's the last time you're going to see them. Yeah. They're gone. Some terrible things happened. Oh, Jesus. Right? Why you got to do this to me? But I bet the next time you see yeah, them, you give you're going to Yeah. You know? We have this too with like, I have this with my phone, right? Is that it's like, fair though? It seems like that's an evil practice. Like, no, it's, like, it's just, it causes you to notice all the good things, right? Yeah. Like the kids one is all oh, terrible, right? Yeah, but like, yeah. let's take my phone, right? Like my iPhone. I lost it, right? I had this yesterday where I was like, did I leave it in the car? Did I leave it at the restaurant? Right. Where is it? Found it in 10 minutes. But in that 10 minutes, I'm like, oh my God, all my photos are on there. Have I backed them up? Like, right. oh, my password is going to be such a pain in the ass. And I get my phone back. I'm like, oh, I wasn't appreciating my phone at all. I had no gratitude for my phone, right. you know, before I lost it. But then you lose it and you're like, yeah. and the negative visualization is good because you don't actually have to lose it. You just have this moment of like, what is this? Yes. You know, what would this be like? And so, it works even better if you could go back to the crappy experience for a little bit. I think travel helps with that, like travel to countries where we don't have as much. Totally. And I think kind of sometimes like if you're in a kind of luxury situation a lot, resetting the experience is good. Sometimes you know, for talks and things like fly first class. And but I don't want to always fly first class because then you get used to it. You got to go back and coach every once in a while because it makes you can't do it. I'm sorry. You should try it. It'll suck that time. But it's, you stopped experiencing the I benefits know. of the. No, no, but this, uh, the, so this is I'm one thing. You got to give me no, one thing. Got, yeah, you First can't. class for me is just like, small. if it's a short flight, fine. But long flights, I can't do it. No, it's good. I'm the old. next the next time you go back, though, you're like, oh, I forgot. They bring the stuff in the glass, not the plastic. Yeah, like, yeah, you you yeah. don't notice any of that now. And so, Or you could just, if it's too hard, you could do the negative visualization. No, there next you. flight, I'm going to be in coach and really think about it like, oh, it's a plastic glass and it's really small. And then when you get it, you're like, oh, this is great. Yeah, we can use imagination to kind of break out of hedonic yeah. adaptation. Another one that I find, and this is like, I think why we get happiness so wrong. We assume if I had all these pleasurable experiences, it would continue to be pleasurable. But like, because we get used to stuff, it's like, you know, the sunset with the Mai Tai, that experience yeah. stretch feels good the one time it's stretched, but we can't, it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to have the privilege of stretching infinitely. Yeah, And that means that like, 
a lot sometimes of my these extraordinary experiences make you feel worse. Also, these extraordinary experiences sometimes make you kind of unable to connect with other people. Mm. I just had this at South by my podcast company had this really I mean, maybe I shouldn't say on the show, but had a really cool kind of, kind of like private concert with folks for like just like thirty yeah. people, and I got to see this amazing band that like last played at Madison Square Garden privately. Yeah. Just like standing there. Yeah. And I'm like, I both had a wonderful experience. And then when I left out, this is going to literally ruin God's <laughs> like, I'm yeah. never going to be able to go back no, and be like, oh, you're in row 20 now. You're like, meh, it's not as good. The other thing is like, I'm like, people, I'm going to go home and people are going to be like, how is South by? I'm like, oh my God, I had this amazing. Right. And like, then I feel like an asshole because like they don't have that experience. Well, and that's tough. And some people don't have that filter. And if you just drop that on a friend, it's like, that's not a very that thoughtful thing that that can crush somebody else totally and so there's this there's this evidence from dan gilbert and matt killingsworth that these so-called extraordinary experiences like you know you get to like i don't know fly to the moon or like go in space or like have some amazing concert or coachella private backstage right you think it's going to be amazing but actually it winds up doing two things it winds up ruining all the other experiences you have because not everything's going to be like coachella backstage yeah and then it winds up making you feel kind of lonely because you can't really share these experiences right. with other people. You feel sort of isolated. Yeah. And this is the thing that happens to people who get these, you know, quick wealth windfalls, right? So people who win the lottery mm-hmm. wind up feeling incredibly lonely because it's like nobody can share these experiences. In one of my podcast episodes on my podcast, The Happiness Lab, I interviewed this guy, Clay Cockrell, who's a, a mental health professional who works with the 0.0001%. So these like super wealthy people. And they complain about things like, they can't make any friends. Like one of them like joined a like, kind of like regular guy, not super wealthy gym. And he was like chatting with the guy like, oh, what'd you do this weekend? Like, and the guy was like, oh, I tried out this new like Mexican restaurant. What'd you do? And he couldn't admit like, I flew with my wife in a private plane to Paris to like try this new champagne. <laughs> it was like, yeah. in tears, like a very similar experience. They both tried something, but he like, right. felt like I can't tell somebody that. And so one thing we don't predict about becoming extremely famous or extremely wealthy is like, You just can't share that. Nobody, not that many people can come along with you on the ride. And so you feel so lonely. One thing that I do, I I love that I have you here because I can, I can throw out some curveballs your way that I'm personally struggling with. We can do just Kevin therapy. Thank you. I would love that. If if, if you can get like a, something I can wear a client in and we can just do a full therapy session. For some reason, um, I I suck at a lot of things, but one one thing that I'm, I'm pretty good at is seeing something and, and being grateful that I'm having that experience. Yeah, yeah. And I have this thing where when something bad happens in our household and it's really not that big a deal, yeah. I'll say to my wife, well, at least we have like warm running water. Yeah. And yeah. she hates that. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, that's not helping the situation. Yeah. And I'm like, we live better than kings. Like kings and queens did not have warm running water in like, Sometimes yeah. if, if you can frame it back to those times, totally, totally. you can just be like, yeah, I missed my FedEx package that I was hoping to get because it was going to be my weekend project, whatever, but I have warm water and yeah. it's clean there and I can drink it. There are people who are dying it. and yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that help or am I just being an asshole? No. So it, it helps, <laughs> but you have to kind of be ready for it. So I guess two things. One is like, what we don't want to get into is the kind of toxic positivity. Like, there's stuff in life that's crappy. Like, there are the FedEx packages that don't come in. There are bad days. But why there's is that tough... crappy? It's but, like, well, so I guess goes. I guess that's the thing. So I think you both want to, like, have a moment to acknowledge the crappy, but then reframe it, right? I think we don't want to get in a knee jerk of, like, any negative emotion is bad. Because right. sometimes negative emotions are normative. Maybe not about the FedEx package. That might right. not be it. But, like... But how do you draw the line? I, this is where I really struggle with, because... Sometimes, you know, my wife, my child, a friend, a colleague will be having a negative emotion where I look at that. And I'm just like, you're just being ridiculous here. Yeah. Like I think the, the world is not like- going to end because of what you're saying right now. And I can't relate. Mm-hmm. And so how do I, re- I should relate though. I should have some yeah. empathy for how they're, they are feeling, right? Is that yeah. the way to do it? I think one thing you can do if you struggle with it is like, First of all, it's like, it's part of the human condition. Sometimes we're gonna be frustrated. Like, And actually there's some evidence that one of the things we want for this recipe of the happiest life is all the emotions. We want right. what, what researchers call a psychologically rich life. You wouldn't want a life where you didn't have the right. moment of like, that damn FedEx, like right. that's an emotion that like, right. you know, it's kind of cool, right? So you can kind of embrace with compassion, like, oh, this is the human condition coming up, how interesting, right? Yes. I think the second thing is 
maybe not with the FedEx, but maybe with the FedEx. Sometimes our negative emotions are useful signals. Like if you're frustrated with the FedEx, that might mean you need to like switch to a different company. Again, that's a kind of narrow example. Right. But like, I think if you're looking at the news and you're feeling really anxious, that's yeah. that's telling you something about how you might want to get involved in the future. If you're kind of feeling lonely or you're feeling really over, overwhelmed is a huge one. I think people feel, you know, you come home and, you know, you use the example of you talking to your wife, like, you know, she's slamming things around and feeling really stressed out. It's like, that's a useful, that's not like, oh, just like, let's, pre you know, we have running water. That's like, oh, this is a useful signal that like something's off and yeah. we might need to rethink things. I so, say the running water thing and it does not land a lot of the time. Yeah, I think, so I think like <laughs> kind of compassion for the human condition and, and the question of like, what is this negative emotion trying to tell us? Yeah. And sometimes you're like, it's not trying to tell me anything. I could just kind of reframe it and be fine. Right. But sometimes you're like, this is actually helpful mm. to sort of pay attention to. And I, and I think this was a spot, again, the ancients were so on top of this, right, that the Stoics kind of got it where it's like, you know, you you can update your negative emotions, but first take a you know take a quick look to see is it telling you something interesting? Because I also watch the people who like just suppress every emotion or yes. just kind of rewrite everything, and, and that kind of gets you into toxic positivity land. It that actually is my downfall as well. Because sometimes if I'm feeling something like that, I'll say, "Well, I have running water," but I'm really just pushing it down a little bit, yeah. and then and then later it manifests. You it's know, gonna come when, back up. When in aggregate, they all add up, and I'm like, oh shit, I, I didn't actually let that go the way I thought I was letting it go. And, that, and that's and a challenge. Sometimes you thing. have to look at the emotion to figure out yeah. what, you know? And so the Buddhists had this lovely analogy for this. It comes with this parable that Buddha used to tell. So the parables Buddha's telling to his followers, he says, hey, if you're walking down the street and you get shot by an arrow, is that bad? And the follower's like, yeah, it's terrible. I guess. Buddha's day, you just get shot by arrows randomly. But yeah. he's like, well, if you're walking down the street, you don't get shot just by one arrow, but you also get shot by a second arrow. Is that worse? And the follower's like, yeah, it's much worse to get shot by two than one. And so Buddha says, the first arrow is life. We can't control it. That's the FedEx package that doesn't show up. That's the bad thing. But the second arrow is on us. It's how we react to it. Yes. And we control that second yes. arrow and sometimes. And so the key is that sometimes the way you don't stab yourself with the second arrow is you regulate the emotion. You think of a thing you're grateful for. You take a couple deep breaths. You reframe it. Yeah. But sometimes the way you don't hit yourself with the second arrow is you don't like squish it down and let it ruminate and right. like it flies out later as many, many arrows that are going to hit everybody around you. Right. A lot of your work has the word happiness in, in, in it. But would you say in reality that's not the goal? Oh, totally. I mean, well, we, we got to define happiness to figure yeah. out what I mean. Like I'm thinking of happiness as, as someone like Aristotle talked about eudaimonia, right? The good life, the meaningful life, the purposeful life. A life well kind of, lived. A life well lived, right? And for that, in the moment, you might not be happy. In right. the moment, you might need to feel anxious or frustrated or challenged or stressed, right? A real happy, joyous life would be the roller coaster. Exactly. And, and in my mind, it would be the adaptability of the individual to survive the ups and downs rather than just be stuck totally down or, or way up because yeah. neither of those things are where you really want to be long term. Totally. I mean, it, I will always joke with my students, you know, that DJ Khaled song, All I Do Is Win. And I was like, that would be a terrible life. <laughs> like, yeah. if all you did is win, you wouldn't notice the goodness of the wins well, then anymore. There's no more winning. And, then, and there's no more winning. Because and like, winning you'd be normal, absolutely anxious yeah. that you could like maybe just lose by one point or something. It'd be terrifying. Well, what if, right? But what if everything was winning, then it's, there's no such thing as winning because exactly. that's just normal. That's just normal. That's just normal. And yeah. I think this is what we forget. This, this is hedonic adaptation, right? Like, if everything is luxury jets, then it's not a luxury jet anymore because that's, that's, right. that's just how you transport, right? Like, if everything is, you know, perfect, you know, I don't know, perfect, perfect champagne, perfect cigars, yes. you don't notice anymore, right? right? So we need the ups and downs. And you can give you those ups and downs, like, you know, as you go back to coach, you can negatively visualize what it's like. You can really try to, like, remember and reframe other yeah. people's lives and things. That's the insidious thing about the good stuff in life as we get used to it. But it has a corollary that's great, which is like, that's also true for the bad stuff, yeah. right? Like we kind of just get used to, I mean, remember COVID when it was like that first week and we're oh like, we God. can't do this. But then April, May, we were just we're making some bread. <laughs> we were like sorting it yeah. out, you know? My like, wine consumption went on up a lot. At first I was like, okay, I'm not gonna drink because I want to need my immune system to be as healthy as possible. And then I'm like, well, you know what? I'm got well, nothing gonna else die. to do. <laughs> yeah, 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 nothing else to do, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna drink, so. Like, I remember thinking in March 15, like this doesn't go away in like a week. I'm, I'm not. I was and I was wiping like, down 
my egg cartons with yeah, like exactly. like Clorox shit. Were you doing that too? Totally. I remember going to the store and putting out all the like fruit and yeah. like like with gloves on, yeah. like washing all. Yeah, you're yeah. like washing. That was so scary. Yeah, but I think that the one of the things that the psychology work teaches us like the worst possible thing that you think could happen in your life could happen, and it would be terrible but you'd still be okay. And it would still have good parts. In my, in my podcast, I, I talked to Dan Gilbert, who's done work with people, for example, who've like lost their kids, you know, like a parent who loses a kid. Yeah. You can imagine oh, the more terrible thing. I can't even And imagine. he says like, obviously it was the most terrible thing, but I learned from it. I learned what matters. I've learned not to take things for granted. Like even the worst possible thing, it's not like, oh, it comes with a silver lining. Like it makes you stronger, right? Like it yeah. kind of gives you this resilience. And so the downs teach us something, yes. right? The downs like allow us to get stronger. And I do worry that sometimes we we think that a good life, a happy life, I think parents think this for kids is like no downs, no stress, right. no failure, but like those things are important. Um, Some parents try to prevent failure in a way that they, they're just trying to help the kid not hurt themselves or something. And in my mind, I'm like, on a one to 10, how bad are we talking here? Because if it's a anything over a four, I want to protect, like, yeah. protect mm-hmm. a little bit, mm-hmm. you know? But if it's going to be a little scuffed knee because you messed up in a way that every other kid has messed up and it cements that learning, that to me is very important. So it's like, to try and get that perfection and just try and take out all the failure from a child, I think is a bad thing totally. to do. Would you agree yeah, with that? Yeah, totally, totally. There's this lovely book by Julie Lithgott Hames called How to Raise an Adult, where she kind of walks through these strategies and she says, parents are sometimes trying to parent for the like right now. You know, you left your lunchbox at home. I'm just going to bring it to yeah. you. Or like, you know, we got to get out the door and you haven't totally learned to tie your shoes. I'm just going to tie them for you. Right. And like, you know, no diss to parents. Like parenting is freaking hard. And like the modern day doesn't make it easy. Sometimes you do have to parent for right now. But often we're we're missing out on learning opportunities for our kids. Like you don't bring them their lunch. They don't have their lunch that day. So maybe they do spend six hours hungry, but like they're going to freaking remember their exactly. lunch the next time. And every time you like fast tie their shoes for them because you got to get out the door. Right. Those are the learning opportunities. Yeah, and so 100%. you might be five minutes late. You know, that's not great. But like and so I think in our kind of parenting for right now and just like solving in the moment, we sometimes don't. We're not kind of allowing our kids to screw up and learn. I think also sometimes, too, parents have to reasonably regulate their own distress about that. You know, you see the lunchbox on the table and you're like, I could I could intervene. Right. But ultimately, the learning, you're going to miss out if you do that. And so but admittedly, it's so hard for parents. It's so hard to kind of watch your kids suffer. But but that's part of, you know, they're not going to die. They're not. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. We're coming up on time. But I I, I did want to ask you a couple more questions. You know, with the title of this podcast, it'll have something, you know, and happiness in the title. There has to be a handful of people out there that are tuning in. They're saying, I'm struggling right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm at that point, that down point, and I've been there for a while. Yeah. I know there's, you know, the the no-brainers. If it's an emergency, there are hotlines to call if you're suicidal. There's things of that nature. What are some tactics, some go-tos that said, I'm having more bad days than good days? Like, how can I get myself out of this rut? If it's really extreme, you got to go get 100%. professional help. I mean, I think of a lot of the strategies we've been talking about here more as like almost like preventative medicine, right? I mean, the analogy I use, if you walk into your doctor's office and you're like, oh, I've got some high blood pressure, I'm not doing so well, your doctor might be like, oh, well, hop on the treadmill, you know, or eat this thing or whatever. But if you walk into your doctor's office clutching your heart saying, I'm having an acute heart attack right, right. now, your doctor's going to be like, well, hop on the treadmill and right, do, you right, know, like right. you need. And so if someone's struggling, like if you're feeling acutely suicidal, definitely reach out to somebody. Yes. Even though your brain can't see hope, because that's what depression does, it puts on these like reverse yeah. rosy goggles that everything looks terrible. You will feel differently, even if you don't feel that way, like reach out and get help. But if you're just kind of, str- you're just like, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling more burned out. I don't have a lot of pleasure in my life. Yeah. I think the first thing to know is like what the science shows is it doesn't have to be that way. There are things you can do to do better, even if it doesn't feel like it. I think the first thing is even if you don't feel like it, reach out to a friend. Like just go through your phone and find someone. Or if you don't have anybody in your phone, no judgment, just like go to a coffee shop or like get, get out in the world 
and just try to have a conversation with a stranger, even yeah. though it feels frictiony. Get off your phone. I mean, phone. you can literally yeah. walk into a Catholic church and sit in a booth if you really needed to, totally. even if you're yeah. not Catholic, right? Yeah. There's so much work by like researchers like Nick Epley and others that like we assume people don't want to talk to us, but people actually are fine to talk to us much more than we think. And it's much more enjoyable for them than we predict. So you have to like overcome your, if you're like, well, not me. No, no, you too. <laughs> like it's, yeah. you know, and, and his data suggests that even if you're an introvert, the act of just like having a calm conversation with a stranger is going to be better than you predict. It's going to be, you know. But what so, do you tell that friend when they pick up, especially in, in my kind of generation where I am now, you know, I'm now in my later 40s, there was this taboo around mental health. And then there still is, yeah. right? I'm uncomfortable with it because I've finally broken down those walls over, you know, a decade of therapy. Yeah. And so I can call a friend and say, hey, I'm having a bad day. Like, how do you encourage someone that may say, I don't want to show that vulnerability. I don't want to show that weakness. Yeah. So don't, don't start with that. Right. That's not how you lead. Right. I would lead with asking other people questions, ask how their day is going. How are your kids? You know, I was just thinking about you and thinking about our old times. Like, yeah. so you start by just making the connection. And my guess is so many things will happen physiologically. Like your body will just kind of calm down. You'll go into sort of more like less fight or flight and more rest and digest mode. Like you'll kind of get the conversation going you'll kind of overcome that speed hump bump of the first part of the talk where it kind of feels a little awkward yeah and then you get things going and then you ask other people to be vulnerable first just like how are things whatever pick up on their questions yeah. and then you can kind of insert your stuff one of the things that research by their surgeon general vivek murthy and others has found is like one thing with loneliness is like, we don't realize that we can reach out to other people. Mm. We can ask how, them how they're going. Mm. We can give advice to them. And that makes us feel so much better. Yes. Right. And so interesting. So it's not about me saying like, hey, I need some help right now. That's not the call. It's just like starting the connection. And there probably is going to be a question back like, hey, well, what's up with you? And you're right? like, and actually, that's, I'm that's having that a hard time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or like you'll just wind up feeling better if you're yes. helping somebody else okay. and reaching out to other people. And, and who knows? Like, I mean, honestly, we're all struggling right now. It's 2024. Everything's falling apart. Like probably if you reach out to a friend, they're going to want to check in with, you know, they're going to want to share what's going on with them. Right? Everybody's their got life. their shit. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that would be thing number one. I think thing number two is just like, get out of the house, move your body. There, there's never a time when I haven't like left the house that I haven't felt a little bit better yeah. than like being my PJs on a screen. Right. Yeah. So just like get out and move your body and the move your body doesn't have to be run a marathon. It can just be like, just take a walk, just be outside. And if possible, even if it's for 10, 15 minutes, like just get away from your phone, like just be present in the world out there. And like all of a sudden things will start feeling a little bit better. So those are some of my emergency go-tos, like yeah. get social, do for others, move your body. Um, those, those can be powerful. That's fantastic. You have a podcast. Is it weekly? Where, what's your, what's your cadence on that? Yeah. We're, we're like trying to get close to weekly, but we're yeah. not perfectly weekly. Tell us about that and what, what people can expect when they tune in. Yeah. It's called the happiness lab and it's, you know, it's all about strategies we can use to, to and feel this is better. Your, is that better. the name of your actual lab? Is the happiness uh, lab or no? Kind of, but okay. we haven't like patented it, but yeah, it's <laughs> the happiness lab. Yeah. And you know, we talk about all these things. We just finished a season on kind of how to navigate communicating better in love and with other people. We have a season coming up. That's about my happiness challenges that are like the stuff I I struggle with. So things like stress and dealing with my time better, perfectionism, which we spoke about is going to be on there. And so it's really just kind of like evidence-based approaches to kind of handle all the stuff that comes up in life. I love that. Where Do you have a dedicated website where people can go and subscribe? Or just anywhere. Yeah. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, Happiness just type Happiness Lab. Lab. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, like, thanks for is, having me. This was fun. Yeah, this is absolutely fun. It is the right time to be having these conversations. I'm so glad you have a podcast around it. And we should mention your Coursera course, right? Because yeah. that 4 million people, is that right? Yeah. Have taken it? Yeah, the science of well-being on Coursera.org. It's kind of like a very short free version of the Yale class I teach. And because... We've seen that a lot of young people need this stuff. We also have a new one called the Science of Well-Being for Teens, which is for Amazing. middle school and high school students. Now, you said a very short version of the Yale course that you teach. Is that something that's publicly available or do you have to be going to Yale to actually get the that? The Yale one live, you got to, you know, enroll in Yale and pay the Yale money oh, and stuff. It. But you get the free version on Coursera. It's much, uh, it's, it's, it's a shorter, not like 26 week version, but it covers all the relevant content and you'll learn exactly what the Yale students are. Any books in your future coming Let's up? Let's hope probably, probably. Yeah. I like the podcast because, you know, so much of the happiness stuff, the, the, you know, these tips that we've been talking about, 
you don't like they're these short little narrative, yeah. you know, these short, quick strategies. And that's what I like. I feel like that's what people need in the moment is like, yeah. I'm feeling frustrated. Or I'm feeling overwhelmed. Or I don't have any time. It's like, well, oh. you're getting it out now versus waiting a year and a half to publish exactly. something. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Amazing. Well, thank you for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me.